So the, the last talk, we're back to Joe, who's, um, who's imparted a lot of uh, great information already. And the, the, uh, the last lecture that we have is titled uh, Growth and Development of Young Stock, Finding the Right Balance. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to continue on from uh, my talk this, this morning. And I, and I showed, again, this definition of optimum growth, which I think is what we're really trying to, to uh, achieve, growth which uh, results in a desirable body size at a specific age with the least amount of developmental problems. This is not a new goal, and I'm going to prove it. <laughs> this is a magazine cover from July of 1994, which is the 30th year anniversary of this uh, article. And the cover story was Beating DOD News from the Front. And the veterinarians in the room uh, and a lot of the breeders will recognize the cast of characters standing here. That's Wayne McElraith on the left, Larry Brambledge in the center, and a much younger and black-headed me on the, on the right. And this was an article in a round table where we were probing the source of cartilage disorders in young growing horses. And it's interesting, I went back and I read this article a couple of weeks ago and we were pretty spot on actually, I think, in, in what we were after. So we've been trying to understand what causes developmental orthopedic disease and what we can do to change it. The very first studies I did was on a big commercial farm in Kentucky in 1991 to 94. We weighed and measured all the foals on this farm over a four year period and we looked at the incidence of OCD. The incidence of surgical OCD was 10% and this was long before survey x-rays came down the, the pike. And what we found was heavier foals had more hock and stifle OCDs. So this was from quite a while ago. And at that point, we became very interested in weighing and measuring horses. And we were very fortunate to work with hallway feeds in central Kentucky. This fellow here on the right, Steve Cadell, started a weighing program. This was back in the early 90s. And this program goes around once a month and weighs and measures foals on central Kentucky farms, and they've been doing it for 30 years. So we've got an incredible data set of growth and development information, uh, thanks to Steve and their, their growth program. So that's where we started to understand how do uh, thoroughbred foals grow. We published some of the stu first uh, data on just general growth in general in the 1990s. And that's where we discovered the, the, uh, this growth, uh, this spring regrowth that I showed you today, uh, way back then. Well, since that time, this growth, uh, these growth studies have expanded. And we've, as I said this morning, literally measured these uh, growth uh, all around the world. And so using this, uh, <coughs> this data, we've learned an awful lot about horses grow. One of the things that came out of collecting all these data was this software program, GrowTrack. And GrowTrack specifically made for entering and measuring growth and development, and a lot of breeders in, in UK use it. Initially, this was a PC-based program. We've now made it a cloud-based program, and it makes it so we can easily uh, gather data, analyze the data, and express the data so that we can compare different groups and different uh, outcomes. So what GrowTrack does is we gather all the data. You can look at it from a tabular viewpoint, but the unique part about GrowTrack is that we also express all of these weights as percentiles of the population. And so a percentile is really neat, and any of you that have kids and have taken them to the pediatrician, they're going to tell you the baby's weight as a percentile of the population and their height as a percentile of the population. It's a very good way to understand how the relative size of horses uh, from, uh, so, and it ranks these individually uh, regardless of gender and age. So all of the data I'm gonna show you this afternoon with the exception of birth weights, which I'll give in kilograms, I'm gonna use percentiles of the population. So if you look, this is the percentile curve for, uh, for thoroughbred colts. 
You can see the pink line is the median, the red line is the 75th percentile, the green's the 25th percentile, and you can see how many kilos deviation there is from the median, and it changes depending on where you are in terms of the curve. This percentile curve was derived from uh, records from 47,000 different folds, so it's a really robust curve we have 23,000 colts and 23,000 fillies. We have a different percentile co uh, curve for fillies from colts. So it's a very handy way that we can express the relative size of these horses. Now we express it two different ways. We, we group them into age groups and we can define this information as either a percentile which is going to be from a scale of 0 to 100, 50 is the median of the population. Or we can also explain it as quartiles, and we'll just divide it into the bottom quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter. So I'm going to share data with you using both of those different types of measures, percentiles and quartiles. So we've done a lot of studies now with all of these data to start to look at how do these growths correlate with either sales performance, racing performance, or the incidence of skeletal disease? This was one study, and I'll go more into depth in, in, in this study in a minute. And this was done from Kentucky in collaboration with Hallway Feeds. In this study, we looked at 1,047 foals. So it's a pretty big uh, data set, 11 Central Kentucky farms, and it was taken over a six-year period. We have body weight and withers height, and we were the in interested in the effect of parity, how many foals did the mare have, our month of birth, how that affect body size, and then how did body size affect skeletal disease and racing performance. We've done a similar study here in collaboration with Saracen. Saracen has a lot of breeders uh, that are weighing and measuring their horses using uh, grow track as well. So we recently uh, did a study here looking at 1,716 foals, so a lot of foals in, uh, in UK uh, over a much longer period of time from 2005 to 2009. Still we were interested in comparing the growth data to performance data. So before I get into those, I'd like to talk a little bit about birth weight. And birth weight's been mentioned a lot today, and I think it's a great idea. If you're a breeder, you should take a birth weight. I think it tells you a heck of a lot about what you've got. And this is a study we did where we compared birth weights in Kentucky, here in UK, and also in Australia. So I'll throw in a second, uh, a, a third uh, country where there's the comparison of birth weights. So in this study, we looked at 800, birth, 800 foals, the birth weight of 800 foals from Kentucky, 934 foals from UK, and 1,327 foals from Australia. And this happened to be one single farm, so it was a pretty uniform record that they had of birth weights. So what do we find about birth weight? Well, first of all, the average birth weights that we had was 56.5 in the U.S., 55.3 here in U.K., and the Aussie foals were a little lower at uh, 53.9. Now, that's the total birth weight without any regard to parity. If you take parity out of the equation, it gets a little different. The, the uh, graph on the right shows all of the actual individual data that we have for individual birth weights in those three countries. If we looked at fillies versus colts, not unexpectedly, the colts were about 1.2 kilograms bigger than uh, the, the fillies, and this is combining all of the, about 3,000 foals together. So now let's talk about dividing the primiparous foal from the multiparous foal. And that was, Pascal mentioned that this morning, and there is a big difference between those. So this slide just shows all of the data. On the left-hand side, we have all the primiparous foals, so that's the first foal out of the mare, and on the right, all of the multiparous foals. And what we found, as a lot of people have, is that parity makes a big difference. And so particularly, the first foal is quite a bit smaller 
than subsequent foals. And we saw differences up until even five foals. But generally, the big differences are the first two foals. The, the primiparous foal, for sure. The second foal is also significantly smaller. And then that, the difference goes away a little bit. Pascal had mentioned this morning about uh, the age of the mare. And it's interesting, I did a comparison where I looked at the age of the mare, whether they were multiparous or primiparous. And so if you look at the foals that were uh, out of mares that were uh, six, five, six, seven, and eight years old, some of those were primiparous foals, but some were multiparous foals. So when you do the statistical analysis between those, the primies out of the five, six, and seven-year-old mares were significantly smaller than the multiparous from the same uh, age group, that there wasn't a significant difference at uh, eight years of age. So there were differences in terms of the parity of the mare, and it's turned out in a lot of the data that we're finding that this primiparous is a very important uh, uh, metric for us to, to measure. When we looked across birth month, we also found that there was a significant difference that early foals were, were smaller than later foals. And this difference between a January foal and a May foal was about 10%. So January foals were 10% lighter than May foals, and they were 7% uh, lighter than April foals. I'd seen this a long time ago, and we always said, oh, God, there's a really big difference in month of birth. But when we started to take into account primiparous foals, a lot of this gets explained. Because in Kentucky, most of the primiparous foals are born in January or February. So if you look at the percentage of foals born in each time that are primiparous or multiparous, you see that in January, 53% of the foals are primiparous and 37% in February. So breeders are breeding maiden mares early. They're trying to get them in foal. They represent a large part of the first population. That skews it a little bit. When we took all of the countries into consideration, the same thing happened. So 34% of the, uh, the, the, and I've got it by month of foaling because we've got Australia here, which is, so that would be uh, August but 34% are primiparous. So that skews the data a little bit. If you take that out and you look at primiparous foals all the way across, you see that they're 51 kilos and the multiparous are up there at 57 kilos. But even with that, there's still a 5% difference between January and May foals. So now let's ask some, some money questions here from birth weights, would you rather have a stakes winner or OCD surgery? So those were the two choices I gave you there. And if we looked, and this is Kentucky data, those that won stakes uh, had an average birth weight of 55.4. The ones that had OCD surgery, 58.7. And that's the distribution on the right of those different birth weights. So you can see that there was a difference in terms of birth weights, and I'll get into that uh, later. Now that's all foals in general. This is interesting. This is primiparous foals. Now I've added a new category here. We have stakes winners on the left, no OCD surgery, and OCD surgery. And what you see is stakes winners, if you have a primiparous foal, is 52 kilos. So they are smaller, but the ones that have no OCD surgery, 51.2, and the ones that had OCD surgery, 55. Point two. Now, that'd be a stakes winner if it was multiparous, but in primiparous, if you look over here on the right-hand side, OCD surgery, those foals, even though they're primiparous, were bigger and skewed to the right like they were a multiparous foal. So that was kind of interesting. So overall, if we put all of the data together, we see that the difference between a primiparous foal and mares that have had at least two foals, it's about a 15% difference. So it's quite a big difference between the parities. So if we look at the uh, number of stakes winners uh, by birth weight, again, this is the stuff people are interested in. You see on the right, we have multiparous foals, 
And Julian, I was glad to hear you say use that 4464 number because those are the bumpers that we have in terms of kind of the birth weights that we're, we're going for. That's where the majority of the birth weights are. But look at the primies. I mean, they're within that area, but they're significantly smaller. And for those that have really small primy porous foals, there's hope because there's a 39 kilo filly that became a group one winner in Australia. So you can still get a, if you have a small foal and it's primy porous, it's not near as big a deal as multi porous. If we look at the top 10% of both sales, and this is yearling sales, are racing earnings against birth weight, you see again, this fits into a pretty narrow category. If you look UKs on the left, there's only 3% of the, ten, the top 10% sales and 4% of uh, earnings that were above that 64. And only 2% below. So that range also fits for both sales performance and earnings. So the, again, that's a, a pretty good set of guardrails for there as well. Now when we compared the foals that were, uh, were born in Kentucky versus the foals that were born in UK, I've got them grouped here from the First, uh, on the left side is one to 30 days, and it goes up on the far right side is when they're yearlings, so it's greater than 360 days. You see there's not really that much difference in the size of the foals from one to 30 days, but look later, when you get into 180 to 360 and 360, the Kentucky foals stayed at the same height. The, the uh, UK foals were actually smaller, and there was a difference, the average was in the 41st percentile. And just the other day, we looked at some data from some very prominent stallions in, in UK, and that's about where they are. It was about in the 42nd percentile for yearlings. So if we look at yearling weight and height, how do they care, compare from a sales perspective? So for these data, I'm gonna rank the yearlings by quartiles uh, and show First, the yearlings that sold in the top 10%. And so on the left here, we have UK foals. I suspect most of these were sold right out here. Um, the top 10% was greater than 350,000 guineas. Uh, on the right, we have the top 10% of Kentucky sales, and that was greater than 436,000. If you look on the left, the highest priced foals or the most, uh, the highest category was the second quartile. That's where that 41% was. If you look at the right, look at the, the Kentucky yearlings. 50% were in the fourth quartile, 25% in the third quartile, 75% of these high selling yearlings in Kentucky were above the median. But if you look in the UK side, they actually weren't. Only 12% of the top sellers we're in the fourth quartile, so there was a big difference. So the question is, do the buyers have it right? And the answer is yes, because these are stakes winners compared to the size of these foals as yearlings. And you see, for the US stakes winners, 44% were in the fourth quartile as yearling, 30% in the third quartile, so there's your 75%, but 38% of the stakes winners in UK came out of that second quartile as yearlings. So we're looking at different sizes here. If we look again at the top 10% in earnings, now this is, is switching to earnings, you see the highest quartile was the second quartile, not stakes winners but total earnings. If you look at it from the US, it's the fourth quartile. This is for body weight, but interestingly, if you look at height, they're both in the third quartile. So you've got both the, the, at the height of the top earners was third quartile, a little above the median, but real, not real tall. So basically the sweet spot is for UK yearling, second quartile body weight, third quartile withers height. For US yearlings, it's fourth quartile body weight and third quartile withers height. So there is a difference. And I showed you this morning, there's a 10 kilo difference there between these two groups of, of yearlings. 
So let's move on and talk about OCD and body weight. How does that, and we've heard a lot about OCD today, but I want to drill into it a little bit more here, in, uh, most specifically in the study that we did in Kentucky. So I, I actually presented these data at the last AAEP uh, conference that was in San Diego last December. 1,047 foals, again, 11 Central Kentucky Farms, looking at parity, month of birth, body size, and skeletal disease. So all of these farms participated in this weighing program. So these guys go there once a month, do the, the uh, body weight, height, and body condition score. So we've got a great data set that was all done by the same technicians. Now, a lot of these farms also did birth weights. The weighing surface doesn't do the birth weight. It only does the weights once a month. But there were 678 of those 1,000 foals that we also had birth weights from. We divided the, the ages into several groups, but I'm going to concentrate this afternoon looking at two age groups, 1 to 30 and the 240 to 360. And I'll explain why I'm interested in that in, in a minute. Uh, we measured the parity or noted the parity of the mares and month of birth. All of these foals, we got their spring survey radiograph reports. And these were all done by private veterinary clinics. There were several different clinics that these farms used. We compiled all of those survey reports uh, to get harvest information about the incidence of OCD in the stifle, hock, and fetlock, and the incidence of sesamoiditis, which is a big deal in the U.S. Uh, market for sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some of those data. Most of these surveys uh, were done in February and March. The average age was 339 days. So when they're diagnosing OCD radiographically, uh, most of the time it's in February and March of the yearling year. When we look at the stifle, uh, there's two different locations in the stifle that are of interest. The OCDs are typically, and most of the OCDs in this study were in the lateral trochlear ridge. There's another area, the medial femoral condyle, that is also a site where you have some issues, but they're not necessarily OCD. They're typically lucencies and cysts. And so those are detected mostly radiographically, where lateral trochlear ridge OCDs can be radiographic, and they're also operated. So for the medial femoral condyle, we had a number of different definitions from just shallow lucencies down to deep sclerosis, clear down to subchondral cyst, and we noted those. We also got surgery reports from all of these farms. The average age of surgery was 362, so most of these surgeries came as a result of the survey radiographs. Uh, in the OCD surgery, there was surgery in the stifle, the hock, the fetlock, and there were a lot of other fetlock surgeries that the surgeons noted as either chips or fragments. I think chips are pretty clear that they're another, another problem besides OCD. Fragments, there's probably a little bit of, uh, of controversy about exactly what they are, but I'm going to put them in a different category that they're not OCD. So what was the incidence of OCD in this group? Well, if we looked at the survey OCD, it was about 15%. And uh, that's divided into 4% in the stifle, 7.5% in the hock, 37 in the fetlock. Uh, if we look at the incidence of surgery, that was survey OCD, it was about 10%. And remember I said the incidence that we saw in 1991 was about 10%, so it was about the same amount. 2.5% stifle OCD, 5.6 hock, and 1.4 in the fetlock, but there were also quite a few fetlock chips and fragments that we considered as a different group, and I'll show you their data. If we look at the birth weight relative to the, uh, the incidence of OCD surgery, again, I've showed you this before, those that had OCD surgery were significantly heavier at birth than the foals that didn't have OCD. 
And this was just in general all foals. But interestingly, if we looked at really big foals, if we looked at foals that were equal to or greater than 63 kgs, so what Julian was talking about, which is about the 90th percentile really for birth weight, we had a two-fold increased incidence of OCD surgery. Those foals that were big foals like that were twice as likely to have OCD surgery. I didn't show it on this slide, but they were a third as likely to win a stakes race as well. So that has become kind of our cutoff as a big foal that is probably not a good idea. If we went on and looked at foals, the foals that had OCD surgery were heavier than foals with no OCD during the, the first 240 days of age. And the ones that had surgery were taller than those that didn't have OCD at every uh, measurement that we made. So these were big, tall foals. But the greatest difference was during the first 30 days, which was really surprising. So this slide that I'm showing you here, I've got on the left percentiles and on the right quartiles. And I've got two different groups. The green group are the foals that didn't have OCD. The red groups are the foals that had OCD surgery. And that's 104 foals, so it's a fairly large group. But look where they were. 48% of the foals that had OCD surgery came out of the fourth quartile and only 4% from the first quartile, where if you look at all the others that didn't, they were kind of evenly spread across. Now, this percentile we use is for the worldwide population, and Kentucky foals tend to be a little bit bigger, but you see that the ones that didn't have OCD represented all the quartiles, but the OCD surgery clearly went into higher quartiles. That's all OCD surgery. This is Hock OCD surgery. And you see that they're in the 44th uh, percentile. This was interesting because I've got three groups here now. I have on the left those that didn't have OCD, those that had stifle OCD surgery in the lateral trochlear ridge, and then all the ones that were described as lucencies in the medial femoral condyle, and a few, the orange ones kind of scattered through that were cysts. And what you can see is there's clearly a, a, a big difference. The ones that had lateral trochlear ridge surgery averaged in the 75th percentile, but the ones that had the medial femoral condyle problems, either lucency or cysts, were the same as no OCD. So there wasn't any relationship between the two. So that was kind of interesting. Likewise, if we looked at the fetlock surgery, the ones that they described as Fetlock OCD were significantly heavier than the, uh, the no OCD, but the ones that they described as having Fetlock fragment or chip surgery were not. So they were not bigger than before. Now again, we also measured the incidence of sesamoiditis. And sesamoiditis, in this case, this was sesamoiditis done from spring survey radiographs. And what we found is the vast majority of them were, were fairly mild sesamoiditis, uh, or it was unspecified sesamoiditis. But what we also found of those that were, were designated as sesamoiditis, the primiparous foals actually had more sesamoiditis than the multiparous. So we wanted to see how these, these uh, weights changed over time. And again, I'm not going to show you every single weight category. I'm going to pick these two out. Why did I pick it out? I picked one to three because that seemed to be a time that was extremely important in terms of this. But the next uh, category is when they did the spring surveys. That was the age range that they were at that point. So in this instance, I've got three groups here. On the left, I've got, uh, this is percentile again. But this time I threw in a new group. The far left group, the blue dots there were NSA. These spring surveys had nothing on them. They were literally clean, no significant abnormalities. Uh, the middle you've already seen is OCD surgery. The right is sesamoiditis, the ones that had sesamoiditis. And if you look at the NSA and sesamoiditis, you can't tell those two groups apart. But if you look at the, uh, the OCD, there's that 
in the fourth quartile. Look though, this is one to 30 days. I'm gonna show you now how these exact same folds looked as yearlings. So watch the change in the graph. This is what happened in terms of the size of these foals. If you look at the NSA, they didn't really change that much. The OCD, they didn't really change that much, but look at sesamoiditis. They now look like the ones that had OCD. So there was a, they grew up to be big. And if you look at their, the percentile in the 1 to 30 to, to the 240 to 360, what you see is the foals that had OCD surgery didn't get any bigger. They, in fact, dropped a couple of percentiles, but the ones that had sesamoiditis increased 13 percentile points. So there was a big change in terms of the from 1 to 30 up. So there was some compensatory growth there in the sesamoiditis group. And what was really surprising about this data set is these are the populations that had OCD versus the ones that had sesamoiditis. They were different foals. There were only 23 foals out of this group that had both sesamoiditis and OCD. They either had one or the other, which was really surprising. Primiparous foals obviously are smaller than multiparous foals. The average body weight in this data set was 51 kilos versus 58 for the multiparous. These are the same data that I showed before for 1 to 30, 30 days. And this is kind of interesting because you see primiparous, look at them, 42% are in the first quartile at one to 30 days, only 6% of them in, are in the fourth quartile. They're all down here, where if we look at the multiparous, a lot of them are up here. Again, that's one to 30 when this was taken, but look what happens when they get up to yearling age. The primies really grow up, and they grow up quite a bit, and while the multiparous don't actually change that much, now, if you look at that between 1 to 30 to the 240 to 360, they don't quite catch up. They're still significantly smaller, 63rd uh, for multiparous, 58 for primi. But look where the primi started. They were in the 34th percentile when they started. And if you look at the change in percentile for the primiparous versus the multiparous, you see there's some real compensatory growth. So if you look at a yearling that's out of a primiparous mare, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between some from multiparous unless you know the month of birth. So what would you expect from those data? Primiparous foals have less OCD. They had six, an average of OCD surgery, 6.7 versus 10. And if you look, the incidence of lateral trochlear ridge surgery was quite low. The data set that we had from, uh, from UK, the same thing happened. Primiparous foals have very little lateral trochlear ridge OCD surgery. Uh, you can see that there was a significant difference, but again, primies are small, that's OCD. What happened with sesamoiditis? Just the opposite. They had more sesamoiditis in the primiparous than the multiparous. So you're starting to see a pattern here. Foals that start small have less OCD, but they have, when they grow up, they have more sesamoiditis. So if we look at month of birth, again, I showed you the birth weights, but this is actually the percentiles of January through May foals, and you can see that there's a big difference that is heavily in, uh, influenced by the, uh, the parity. But if we look at a February foal versus an April foal, February foals are significantly smaller at one to 30 days than uh, April foals, but they're actually significantly bigger by the time they're yearlings. So we have that compensatory thing going again. So what do you think about OCD and sesamoiditis? It's gonna show the same thing that we saw for OCD and sesamoiditis for primiparous foals, they had less OCD, the February foals, but they had more sesamoiditis. And so this was the finding that we went all along. 
So finally, I know you've been waiting all afternoon to figure out what's the best month for you to have a, have a foal. Well, we looked at that in both the U.S. and U.K., and there's a lot of different ways that you can, that you can measure that, but this is a pretty good one. This is percent stakes winners by month of birth. And this is both, uh, and both of them had about 6% stakes winners in this group. But the foals that were born in February had a higher percentage of stakes winners than in other groups. And you can see that May was below the average uh, April, but that February kind of outperformed that. If we look at the incidence of OCD by month of birth, and this uh, is survey radiographs, we see that in Kentucky, we have a higher incidence of, of radiographic OCD in April foals, but that turned out to be in May foals in this data set that we had from UK. And so if we drill into this a little bit, these are the American survey radiograph data, and you see, the highest incidence was 19% compared to an average of 14%, where there was only about an 11% incidence in February foals. Now, all of the UK vets sitting here are going, God, that's a lot of HOC OCD. And that's a big difference that we've seen between the two populations. The foals in Kentucky tend to have more HOC OCD. And I think that's to their body size and their conformation. Fortunately, HOC OCD is uh, pretty forgiving. And the, the, uh, most of these, a lot of them get operated and it doesn't affect their sales or their racing performance. When we looked at the incidents in surveys, again, we saw a very high proportion of stifle OCDs in the UK foals from May. If we looked at surgery, it's basically the same thing. The highest instance of surgical OCD was in April foals, uh, and in UK, there was a high incidence of stifle OCDs. Now, I'm going to put a big asterisk beside this because that's a pretty small percentage of the total population. So we're talking about only about 55 foals in this group that we had survey radiographs that were actually born in May, but there was uh, <coughs> a lot of them had stifle OCD surgery in May. And May foals in uh, UK are bigger than January or February foals. So bottom line, if I uh, wanted to summarize all these data, in the U.S., in February, it represented 24% of the total fold crop and 35% of the stakes winners, but only 16% of stifle uh, OCD surgery. So February is looking pretty good. April, on the other hand, had a high incidence of OCD. That's from the Kentucky data. If we look at the UK data, the February foals had a higher uh, uh, strike rate for stakes winners, 28% of the population, 34% stakes winners, and only 16% of the, uh, the stifle surgery, where I've already said in May there was a higher incidence. So in conclusion, these, these data struck me as this is really odd. Why are we predicting OCD surgery that's going to happen in yearlings from the 1 to 30 day old weight? Because that seemed to be the, the age that was most predictive and connected to the incidence of OCD. And I think the answer to that may be in the way that, that the skeleton develops. The skeleton essentially starts as all cartilage. And the, the way that bone is formed is there's a secondary center of ossification that slowly cartilage is converted to bone. But in the early days, there is a lot of vasculature in the uh, epithelial cartilage. It's very vascular. By the time it matures, all of those blood vessels go away, and there is no vascularity actually in the articular cartilage. And there's been a lot of data that's been done in Scandinavia studying the incidence of OCD in both pigs and in horses, and they've done some elegant work. And they say that a lot of this OCD 
occurs very early on, and it's a failure of blood supply in that epiphyseal growth cartilage quite early on. And this is knocking on to OCD. So basically what happens, if you have a failure of blood supply in that cartilage, some of it just resolves, it gets better on its own. Some of it, if it delays ossification, endochondrial ossification, it's actually repaired and you never see it. It's the ones that end up with a fracture of the articular cartilage that creates a flap that ends up OCD and ultimately surgery. And so the idea is if you have a very heavy foal early on, it disrupts this blood supply to that cartilage that this creates a lesion that doesn't resolve or repair and you eventually see it with surgery. Now all of the, the, the other factors with exercise, heavy weight, can lead to, that, to the clinical expression of that OCD, but it looks like possibly it's happening quite early in life. So there's a lot of things that can cause OCD. It's, as, as a number of speakers have said, it's multifactorial. There's heredity confirmation, certainly the environment. We think nutrition is important, but I'm gonna move body weight up a little bit and very early body weight as something that we think is important that contributes to OCD. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, any questions for Joe as the last speaker? Or questions for the speakers from before if you've got any last ones? Pascal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for, this is really interesting. I'm just wondering why uh, we didn't see OCD in the enhanced uh, falls, but we had low numbers, so I don't think we, statistically, we were not powerful enough. Um, but, you know, they were, dis they could be disturbed in, uh, in um, metabolism. So it's really nice that you show that because it really goes with the Barker curve where, you know, the danger is in the very small mm. and in the very big and the good is in the middle. Um, and one of the questions is my, my colleagues from Belgium told me that they actually could see some OCD lesions in three days old falls. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you think that happens? Well, I think it's, it's happening from disruption of that cartilage. Um, that the vasculature gets, gets crushed. And they've, the Scandinavians have done some really elegant stuff where they've done s repeated serial CT scans and have shown how the vascular is damaged and in some instances repairs and in some instances doesn't. In swine, which they've studied a lot, you can have 60 or 70 percent of all the pigs develop OCD lesions that resolve and you never see that they go away. So it kind of makes sense that biomechanical stress and strain could be something that could actually lead to an, an OCD lesion. Thank you. I just wanted to add something else. Um, we've sort of looked at some similar things, but we put gestation length into our models around these type of things. And really interestingly, um, so we saw an association between gestation length and developmental orthopedic disease, and it was the foals with the shorter gestation lengths that had an increased risk. But interestingly, when we uh, put the gestation length in the model, the birth weight did, was not significantly different when you account for, we did like multivariate modeling, when you account for the gestation length. So you're essentially having foals with a different gestation length born with the same birth weight. So there must be a difference in, in, in utero growth rates. So, you know, we know our sesamoiditis foals have the higher postnatal growth. Personally, I think, and from what uh, Pascal's told us about the nutrition and what Joe said, our OCDs are probably growing too fast in utero, maybe. I would just throw that out there. We need to look at the mere nutrition. Yeah, that's interesting. And in these past data, we didn't uh, record gestation length in the US. Now that's something that we do. We've added it to the software, so if you put a breeding date, it'll automatically uh, calculate gestation length, which I think is an important parameter. You're absolutely right, and it's hopefully all of these 
these studies that I showed also are sort of dynamic. This is the first time that we've done the data, but we're continuing to collect these data as we go. And so I think we'll get bigger numbers and it'll make more and more sense as we go along. Yeah. Right. Sure. Could I could I ask you one, one question on one of the earlier slides, which is where you showed the pri price of the horse or um, mm -hmm. the quartile in America being the heavier ones were in the fourth quartile, and in the um, UK they were in the second. Mm -hmm. Do you know, know the reason for that? Is it because they were dirt horses as opposed to um, uh, turf horses? Or I think absolutely. I think that's a hundred percent. Um, what it is that we've selected over the last 20 years and, and yearlings have actually become 20 pounds heavier in, in the U.S. over the last 20 years and we've got big hindquarters on dirt horses with fairly straight confirmation behind so I think it's completely uh, related to the types of horse that we're breeding for dirt versus turf I think that's a hundred percent what the, the difference is.